wow, aren't you just blown away by these talks today? It's amazing. So uh, I, I have an ask for you. Uh, I want you to get engaged in trying to get people out of prisons, and I want to see action that will actually make a difference to, to violence. Now, I want to start a little bit with the long story as to why I'm making this plea. I was a young kid in England who was very good at solving problems, very good at math. And I got into Cambridge quite young. My vision was to become a nuclear physicist. So I took a year to work on a uh, marine freighter, a ship going around the world. And about two months after I'd been on that freighter, I was the victim of a brutal assault. I thought I was going to die. I still have memories of what happened. And about two weeks later, the guy who sat opposite me at every one of my meals murdered the guy who sat next to me. That radically changed how I wanted to use my math and problem-solving skills. Few people understand that the US, the most affluent country in the world, the country with the best medical system in the world, has the highest levels of homicide of the affluent democracies. What that means is Chicago, Toronto, two cities the same size, 10 times as many people, young men murdered in Chicago every year as in Toronto. It also is the country that makes the most use of incarceration. When I was working on that freighter, the United States was already the champion in the affluent democracies in terms of use of incarceration. You used to get 99 years, followed by 99 years, for a black raping a white woman. And that was quite common. Today, it has gone to four times that rate. That's 2.2 million people, almost the population of Toronto incarcerated. You have to think about what this means. Five times the rate of the average in the world, seven times the rate of countries like Canada or Germany. So on the one hand, you have a lot of homicides, and on the other hand, you have people trying to lock up these people because, because I don't actually know why, but because they think punishment is somehow the answer to people killing each other. It is not. Now, many people think the United States are very right-wing, vengeance-seeking people. They're not. They're actually no different from Canada or England or Australia. More than 60% of them think that the way to deal with violence is by investing in the root causes, investing in education, investing in jobs. They prefer that investment over something that the politicians that the politicians legislate and use our taxes to waste people's lives. Now, the United States also excels in evidence. Remember, I like numbers. I like proof. I like experiments where you actually try something. You try and tra train a young man, and you compare him with another young man who hasn't been trained. You do this with 100 that you give the training to and 100 who don't, chosen at random, and you find out what the results are. The United States has done more of those experiments than any other country, than any other country. It has access to incredible, powerful knowledge about how we can stop violence. Now, I want to tell you just a little bit about what that science actually tells us. So, amongst the things that it tells us is that the way we spend our money on policing today doesn't work. 60% of all the dollars going into policing in North America 
go to responding to 911 calls. By definition, if there's a 911 call, you have a dead body, you have somebody injured. It's not before. It's not stopping the violence before it happens. In addition to that 60%, we have another 20% investigating. It's actually not very good at investigating. We don't catch a whole lot of people. Now, there is a little bit of science in, in, in policing. Stop and frisk, you may have heard of it. This is where police in Jane Finch in Toronto or in areas of New York go into the area and go up to people who they think are suspicious. They happen to be poor black young men, typically. And they try and catch them if they've got guns or drugs, typically marijuana. It's the whack-a-mole system. You try and catch a few, and they keep coming, bouncing up. Yeah, they go to prison, but other people come and do the same things. This just doesn't work. What does work is solving the problems in those places where police are responding. The police in any city organize their 911 to be there where the calls are coming. They're called problem places, hot spots. We, as a society, have not said, well, how can we solve these problem places? Remember my math training. What we know is that mentoring, simply volunteering to help be a role model, teaching life skills so that people don't abuse alcohol or drugs, coaching single mothers so that they can bring their, parents, uh, their kids up better, reaching excluded youth, all of these work. Crimesolutions.gov is a website that gives the U.S. data on what works. Notice the word solutions, solutions to problems. In the smart period we live, you can use your smart phone to access that and see what works. It's as simple as that for a politician who really wanted to reduce violence to just use his or her smartphone to access that website and they would see actions like this. They would not see incarceration as a solution. They would not see 911 calls as a solution. So we have these solutions. They're easily available, easily accessible on the web. Uh, on the web. Now these successful programs are delivered by people other than the cops, courts, and corrections industry for which we pay heavily. We pay heavily in taxes, and we pay heavily in human lives. Those are delivered by people delivering social services, by schools, by volunteers, by youth services. Now, I want to just put one parenthesis in here. There's a lot of violence in problem places. There's also too much violence in places where people are studying in schools, in universities. Date rape. I like the word rape. I don't like rape, but I like the word because it tells you more of what it's about. This is not a mild sexual assault. So young women in schools between the ages of 15 and 18 are at very high risk to be a victim of a sexual assault. We know how to stop that. We know that if we can help those boys understand what is consensual sex and know how to negotiate what they want, we can reduce that. A famous Canadian experiment done in the London, Toronto area has received accolades for doing that. Do we use it in schools? No. In universities, just two months ago, the Attorney General of the United States in a speech basically about incarceration and prevention of violence mentioned a statistic very well known to people like me, that one in four women who graduate from a university or college in North America will have done it after being a victim of a sexual assault. Are university presidents concerned about this? No, they deny it. They deny it. But when university presidents face it, they bring in a program that empowers the fellow students to intervene to stop what might be a sexual assault from happening, to divert the man, to take the woman home. We know how to stop this, but we're not yet doing it. 
So the main punch that I have for you today is about how we can get to smarter crime control. Smarter crime control. What we've got to do is we've got to learn from success, like how you actually re reduce sexual assaults on a university campus, but also how you can reduce violence in those problem places. The city of Glasgow in Scotland decided that reacting to emergency calls, 999, was not a solution. Trying to find out who did it was not a solution. They were right. So in order to decide what to do, they diagnosed the problem. When you go to the doctor for 20 minutes, he or she spends 19 minutes diagnosing your problem and one minute on the remedy. On crime, we spend no time diagnosing and we wonder why we have the rates that we do. And of course, our remedy is just, well, we should punish you if we can convict you. So what Glasgow did was diagnose plan how to implement the solution, some of which were copied from the American website that I just mentioned, from American experiments, and evaluating results. Do we have any results that show that policing actually reduces crime? No. Do we have any results that the 75% of people who come in front of courts in the United States have been there before? Is this not evidence that it doesn't work? Do we have any evidence that incarcerating people? No, we don't. We need to focus on violence reduction results, and that means evaluating. Now, we need to start reinvesting in what works. We're spending a lot of money on that COPS, Courts, and Corrections system, a lot of money. So we have to take a portion of it. The Brits are taking 25% off policing. There's been no change in the crime rate. So that's a big amount. I'm happy if we just shifted 10% from what doesn't work into what does work because we can get, with just 10% using that knowledge, 50% fewer victims. Now, a lot of what we need to do actually provides better futures than somebody who's going through incarceration. Just doing that, we can save, in the United States, I like numbers, $300 billion in harm. That's $300 billion in loss of quality of life from doing this. It's halving the homicide rate harming the, the real number of women who are raped, reducing muggings and assaults. Now, we've also got to find ways to actually save tax money. So we've got to use cost-effective solutions. The state of Washington, they're the folk who uh, have legalized marijuana. They actually have a group advising politicians along the lines of the sorts of things that I have just been able to skim for you today. And basically, if you look at that data, we can save a very large amount of taxes. Now, if we cut our losses on incarceration in somewhere like the United States, you bring it back to 1960s, 1970s levels. And if, in addition, you get a small benefit from legalizing marijuana like Colorado and, and Washington, then you can save, and I want you to listen to this, in the United States, $100 billion. $100 billion. So in any affluent country, we can save, we can't save quite as much per capita as the Americans because they're spending so much on incarceration, but in any of the affluent countries, we can save big amounts of tax dollars while we are reducing violence and avoiding wasting money and lives on over-reliance on incarceration. So what is my ask to you today? My ask to you is to demand more from your politicians. I already showed you the public actually agrees with a lot of this. The data agrees with what I'm saying by definition, because that's why I'm saying it. But the politicians are not doing that. So it's time to educate politicians. I've just recently completed a guide to politicians on smarter crime control. 
easily readable. It's in plain English. The prescriptions as to what the legislators have to do is very clear. And my ask to you is that you get active in stopping violence, stopping violence on campuses, yes, and stopping violence in those problem places and getting your taxes used in a way that reduces the number of victims and gives us all better futures. It's in your court. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Waller. Thank you so much.